Let me uh, say, first of all, that it is a great honor and I think a great responsibility uh, to be allowed to be here tonight and to have a chance to try to share ideas and to talk about uh, the future of Michigan and therefore, in many ways, the future of the United States. So I, I want to start from that perspective. And I've, I've been thinking for the last couple of days, because I've been very surprised. I've done a fair amount of research into the Leadership Council and into the Mackinac Center and into a variety of other places. And there are a ton of ideas. I mean, there, there are a lot of smart people who sort of generally know what needs to be done and have done great analytical work. And I began to look at sort of a tale of three governors I was going to share with you, one of whom you all know very, very well, John Engler, uh, second of whom uh, Rick Perry has been the most successful job creator in the, in the country in the last decade in Texas, and then because I knew that from a Michigan standpoint, a Texas governor might not actually be seen as a valid model. Uh, I was looking at, uh, I was doing, really reading Chris Christie's uh, speeches and his work in New Jersey uh, because it's pretty hard not to argue that there are a lot of similarities between New Jersey and Michigan as northern industrial states with strong union cultures. Uh, and I think, in many ways, I'd argue Chris Christie is the most interesting governor in America today and worth your looking at. But I realized that the, the first hurdle you have to get over is how serious is the problem and how serious are you about change? Because we can dance around the edges and we can all talk about collaboration and working together and communicating. The truth is, you reach certain crossroads and you change or you don't change. So I want to tell you three stories, uh, two of which I got from Sonny Bono. Um, and they were very important stories. Um, Sonny Bono had had a very successful career. And he'd had, I think, 10 uh, gold records. He'd had a top 10 show on CBS. Uh, he had really done very well financially. And his career sort of faded away. I mean, it, again, a little bit to imagine having been the greatest industrial center on the planet and then gradually not being the greatest industrial center on the planet. And, and he couldn't come to grips with change. And so he kept clinging to guest spots, and he finally found himself doing Treasure Island, or, or Fantasy Island, rather. Many of you, how many of you remember Fantasy Island? Okay. So the real star on Fantasy Island is Tattoo. Right? Okay. So here's Sonny Bono, and it's getting to him, because, you know, what happens, of course, in Hollywood, which is a relentlessly commercial place, despite its ideology, uh, is that you gradually get a dressing room the size of your current stardom. And so he went from having an entire Winnebago to having a room. And he's finally in his room one day, and he's driving him crazy. And he's thinking, how can I be here? What does this mean? What's happened to my career? Now, I got this story because we were in the middle of a crisis in the first year of our being a majority. And we were meeting at 10 o'clock at night with our entire conference trying to solve a problem. And we were totally in a mess. And Sonny got up and starts telling the story. And we're all, of course, staring at him, going, what are you doing? Because <laughs> he wasn't behaving like a normal member of Congress. He was talking like some Hollywood person. And he says, so I go out to do the scene I'm supposed to do. And I'm so rattled that I refer to the star on set while filming as Tom Tom. <laughs> and he blows up. And here's this very short person jumping up and down, screaming at me with his face getting red. And I stand there staring at him. And I look up and I say, thank you, God. I got it. My career's over. Find something, <laughs> you know. <here." laughs> And so he says, he walks off the set. It's the end of his career as an actor. He gets it. It's no longer real. He finds something new to do, which gets me to the second part of the story. So he had a place out in Palm Springs, or, or one of the communities, I think it was Palm Springs, but it's one of the communities in the Palm Springs area. And he decides he's going to, you know, open an Italian restaurant. Your name is Sonny Bono. You don't do Greek. I mean, right? 
And so he wants to open an Italian restaurant. And the city has a city clerk that you have to get a license from. And he goes in, and the city clerk's on coffee break. And he goes back later, and the city clerk had lunch. And he goes back the next day, and the city clerk doesn't have the right forms. And this goes on for like two weeks. And finally, he, the city clerk says to him, you know, I think we have enough Italian restaurants. And I don't know that you're ever quite going to get your license. And Bono says, that's fine. Because I've given up running a restaurant. I have a new career. And the guy goes, you do? And he says, yes. I'm running for mayor, and when I win, I'm firing you. <laughs> <clears throat> And that was the beginning of his political career. Now, I tell you those two stories as a starting point for this conversation, because I think they both relate very directly to where Michigan is today and where Detroit is today. You know, it's either about real change, which is the title of a book I wrote a while back, or it's about baloney. I'm here as an outside observer who's been coming to Michigan for over a quarter century to tell you, if it's about baloney, you're wasting your time, the state's going to keep decaying, and you're not going to be competitive. So you just need to decide, are you into real change, which is going to be hard, painful, difficult, time-consuming, frustrating, conflict-laden, or do you want to love each other while you decay? Because there's no middle ground, because real change is going to be hard. And unless you come to grips with that, and understand that you're not going to get very far. There are reasons the system hasn't changed. There are reasons it has absorbed the largest population loss of any state in the country without change. There are reasons it has lost more half the jobs in the U.S. according to the Business Council. Half the jobs in the U.S. that were lost were lost in Michigan. There are reasons. But nobody wants to talk about the reasons because it would be politically incorrect, it would lead to conflict, we'd have a difficult time, we'd become ideological, we'd become partisan. So my first key point is you've got to make a decision. Everybody who wants a successful Michigan has to be for real change or you're kidding yourself. And you ought to think about what would a Michigan success story be like over the next 10 or 15 years. That's part one. And if you want to look at how to plan that, Nancy Desmond and I wrote a book called The Art of Transformation, which is a graduate level work on how you fundamentally think through large scale change. Because it's an art form, it's complicated. There are people who've done it, but there aren't many, and it takes an enormous amount of thought, and, and, and it's, it's a principled behavior. Just as Drucker's The Effective Executive or Deming's work on quality is about principled application. The second story I want to tell you, we, uh, Clist and I are leaving Sunday to go to uh, Poland and Italy to premiere uh, in, in Krakow and Warsaw and Rome, a new movie we just made uh, called Nine Days to Change the World, which is about Pope John Paul II uh, going to Poland as the first Polish pope in history in 1979. Now, it has very direct relevance to Michigan because it's about courage and it's about commitment. And they weren't just faced with the kind of fighting we have in a free society. They were faced with a Soviet totalitarian dictatorship that was prepared to beat priests to death and prepared to lock people up for years. And the Pope, when he became named as Pope, which was an enormous shock, uh, in fact, such a big shock that the communist premier of Poland said on hearing the news, uh, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, it's the end. Which, if you think about it, for a communist to have said that was a pretty interesting comment in itself. Um, the Pope's initial phrase when he first became Pope was, be not afraid. And that would be my message to the people of Michigan. Be not afraid. Have the courage to come together, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Arab, Asian, doesn't matter what your background is. Come together as Michiganders and be not afraid. Put on the table the future, not the past. Make an agreement. The 1930s UAW Ford strikes are over. The 1930s UAW General Motors strikes are over. Get over it. The racial problems of Detroit in the past are over. Their burdens linger. But deciding we're now going to refight the past is not going to create a new Michigan. 
It's going to guarantee failure. So how do you bring everybody together in a room to say, what's the future? How do we make sure that whatever your background is, whatever your neighborhood is, everybody gets to be part of a better future? And that requires a courageous conversation. It requires a conversation of, of being open and vulnerable and talking about what do we need to do and being honest about how hard it is. The poorest neighborhoods in America are very hard. They're hard on the people who live in them. They're hard on the reformers who try to change them. And most of the time, we've failed. And we don't have the courage to admit the failure. And so we have fundamental things to talk about among friends. It's the second part of the Pope's visit that is kind of amazing, that I've, I've taken to heart. We, we ended up making this movie because two years ago, we made a movie called Ronald Reagan, Rendezvous with Destiny. And when we, we shot part of it in Europe, and we were in Gdansk and interviewed Lech Wałęsa, and then we were in Prague and interviewed Vaclav Havel, and both of them said to us, you know, the really key moment in the collapse of the Soviet Empire is a year and a half before Reagan's elected. It's in June of 79, when the Pope visits Poland for nine days. And my wife's family, her fa on her father's side, is Polish from the Krakow region, so she was fascinated, so we did this movie. And as we were doing it, we learned two really important things that I think affect where we are today, and it'll be a very interesting test for the self-defined leadership of the state. It may well decide whether or not a decade from now you're still the leadership. The first was when the Pope arrived in Warsaw on the very first morning at mass in Victory Square, there were three million people. And we have several people in our movie who say, you know, we looked around this crowd and we suddenly realized there are more of us than there are of the government. Maybe they should be afraid of us instead of us being afraid of them. And I just want to suggest to you that's a key part of what you have to think through. Who are the people of Michigan? What is the center of gravity of Michigan's future? Who should be listening to who? And it's not necessarily the old order in either party, in Lansing, in Detroit, or anywhere else. Second, they launched out of this experience a 10-year conflict. Now think about this in terms of your own planning. From the time the Pope arrives in June of 1979 to the time when they held the first free elections in a, in a Soviet state in, on June 4th, 1989, is 10 years. And this isn't having a union mad at you or the country club mad at you or one of the local newspapers mad at you. This is a police state trying to crush resistance. Literally beating to death a, 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 Poli, a, a Polish uh, priest and throwing him in the river. Who's now, become, I think, going to be sainted next week. So in that context, one of the things that the Polish people did, which really changed my own thinking, is they developed a slogan that they used to undermine the Soviet state. And I'm going to share it with you, and it's a little radical. But they used the term 2 plus 2 equals 4. I know it's bold. <laughs> it's out on the edge. But let me tell you why it mattered. They would put signs in store windows. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now, the state knew that it was subversive. But they couldn't figure out how you'd go into the store and say, you can't have 2 plus 2 equals 4 in the window. I mean, it makes you sound like you're really stupid. I think it came from two places. It came first from Camus, who writes in his novel, The Plague, that there are times when a man can be killed for saying 2 plus 2 equals 4 because the authorities can't stand the truth. Now, I'll give you an example, because I'm going to meddle a fair amount in this speech. This is not going to remain abstract and theoretical. The fact that you don't currently have an open conversation about the fact that teachers don't contribute a penny to their own health insurance and that almost nobody else in the state has that kind of a deal would be a 2 plus 2 equals 4 moment. And it's worth your looking at. And I'm not trying to pick a fight with anybody. I'm just saying, once you start saying 2 plus 2 equals 4, it's amazing how many things start to fall out and how you have to have an honest conversation, you have to put numbers up on the board, and all of a sudden, all of the old arguments start to disappear because they're silly. Second example. In 
his novel 1984. George Orwell, who, remember, is a left-wing intellectual, but who is fear very fearful that centralized bureaucracy leads to dictatorship, just as Hayek is in The Road to Serfdom. Orwell writes a novel about totalitarianism, not in the Soviet Union, but in Great Britain. And in that novel, the torturer on behalf of the state says to the innocent citizen, if we tell you that 2 plus 2 equals 3, it equals 3. And if the state tells you 2 plus 2 equals 5, it equals 5. And the citizen's thinking, but wait a second. What if 2 plus 2 equals 4? Which he doesn't say because he doesn't want to get tortured anymore. Now, let me give you an example of an American test of 2 plus 2 equals 4 so you can see where this leads you to. Because this is not just theoretical. This is not just abstract. I'm going to give you half of a sentence. I want to see how you would finish the sentence. If you can't afford to buy a house, what's the second half? Ah, no. Tricky question here. After all, this is Michigan. You've spent a generation throwing away prosperity by making sure you cross-subsidize people who weren't productive. So I'm asking you a tough question. I'll be glad to defend that when we get to questions, because it is absolutely a fact. And until you confront the fact, you cannot afford anyone being unproductive if you're going to compete with China. And if you're not going to compete with China, you're not going to be successful. You don't have to worry about Wisconsin. You don't have to worry about Illinois. Your benchmark is China because China is the next generation's Toyota. And China is much more formidable than Toyota, and China is going to push us to the wall to be competitive with them. And we had better learn to be the most productive, most innovative people on the planet, or we are not going to be able to compete with them. So, now, having set the stage deliberately, so you'll understand, there's an underlying philosophical message here. How many of you agree, if you can't afford to buy a house, don't buy it? All right, now raise your hand. This is very important psychologically. How many of you would agree, if you can't afford to buy a house, don't buy it? You need to really think about this. And I'll be glad later on during the question and answer session for those of you who didn't raise And by the way, I've had more people not raise their hand in this audience than any audience I've talked to in three months, <laughs> which I think is just fascinating. Now, why does that matter? It matters because the government of the United States has been lying for 25 years. The government of the United States has said, if you can't afford to buy a house, we'll waive your credit. If you can't afford to buy a house, we'll waive a down payment. If you can't afford to buy a house, we won't require you to pay any principal for three years. If you can't afford to buy a house and you can't even pay interest only, we'll let you have a subsidized interest rate. And guess what we learned? It turns out, it turns out that if you can't afford to buy a house, the first time the roof leaks, the first time the electrician is required, the first time an appliance goes bad, the first time the plumbing goes out, you can't afford to buy a house. Now you do that to one family, and it's a personal tragedy. You do it to a million families, you create a crisis. Yet have you heard any national politician say, this is a cultural problem? This is all going to come right back to Lansing and right back to Detroit. Because 2 plus 2 equals 4. If you have a school which isn't functioning, you ought to replace it. Now you can replace I don't care if you replace it with unionized workers or non-unionized. I don't care what the circumstance is. But if you don't know the school's not functioning, and you don't realize that you are condemning those children, to have a greater likelihood of going to prison than going to work. And you're willing to tolerate destroying a generation of children for some abstract argument, then you don't get 2 plus 2 equals 4. And, and whether it's the Cornerstone program or a dozen other programs, I'm not here to argue for any single solution, but I'm here to tell you, every time you walk off and lack the courage to confront a school that's failing, you are leaving children behind. So let's let me continue then with <clears throat> 2 plus 2 equals 4 for a minute. 
This is the first thing you have to really think about, because this is a big decision, much bigger than politics in a normal sense. I believe unequivocally the only benchmark that matters is China. And the reason I believe that is because if you benchmark, just think about it as a sports problem. If you benchmark against the very best and you get to be good enough to compete with the very best, all the others get taken care of. Now, very simple symbol. Volvo is a Chinese company. Jaguar is an Indian company. I mean, how many more warnings do we have to get? And what does that mean? It means you'd better be the highest quality, lowest cost producer on the planet. And it means if you want to create jobs in Michigan, you start from a very simple premise. What is it going to take to be the highest quality, lowest cost producer on the planet? Because if you create that condition in Michigan, jobs will flood into Michigan. Remember, in the mid-90s, when Engler was at his peak and had really achieved remarkable changes, you had, you had a lower unemployment rate than the national average. You also had the best bond rate in the country. You paid the lowest interest on your debt. And he had reduced the size of government by 20%. Now, that's a different world. That's why he's one of the three governors I think you ought to study. Because during the period that he was trying to drive real reform, and we built welfare reform off of John Engler, George Allen, Mike Levin, uh, Mike Levitt, rather, and, and Tommy Thompson. And it's the most successful single social reform in modern history. Two-thirds of the people in welfare either went to work or went to school. Fundamentally raised their incomes, created a different life for them, did lowered costs, changed the welfare office into an employment office. Fundamentally different attitude. 92% of the country favored welfare reform when we did it. Because we'd won an argument. I'm going to give you another 2 plus 2 equals 4. Reagan proposes welfare reform in 1966 running for governor. It's a very radical idea. Charlie Murray writes a book called Losing Ground in which he argues that, in fact, the rise of the modern welfare system fundamentally undermined the poor because it created people who were dependent on the government and taught their children that you didn't have to have effort, you didn't have to have a work ethic, you could relax and not worry. Uh, the year I was elected as speaker, uh, there was a book called the, the Tragedy of American Compassion which came out, which argues that if you go back and you look in the 19th century, all of the 19th century social reformers deeply oppose giving money to the poor because it undermined the work ethic and it subsidized alcoholism and drug addiction. And they were very vehement about it. And so this, this, the, the Marvin Alasky wrote that book. So we, by the time we got to welfare reform in 1996, 92% of the country favored welfare reform, including 88% of the people on welfare. We'd won the argument. Giving people money for doing nothing was destructive. It created dependency, weakened their independence, taught bad habits. Now I want you to think about that for a second. Let me go back to 2 plus 2 equals 4. How many of you agree that giving people money for doing nothing is essentially destructive? I want you to think about this minute, because I'm about to take you out on a very radical limb. So the other day, I'm reading about the excitement of some senators at having passed an extension of unemployment to 99 weeks. And I'm thinking to myself, first of all, I'd be much more happy if they'd extended employment. Because <laughs> I have a very big pro-bias, and if you go to americansolutions.com, you'll see five big tax cuts that we think would create jobs, and we think you ought to have a bias in favor of creating jobs. But second, I remembered that Larry Summers, when he'd been an academic before he went into the White House, had written a paper that said, it's very dangerous to have extended unemployment benefits because people tend not to look for work until four weeks before their benefits run out. And this is, of course, with Summers as an academic, not Summers as a politician, where he denies he actually meant that uh, because he actually thinks 2 plus 2 equals 27, and he doesn't want you to worry about the details. So then I read one other thing, which really led me to a very bold proposal. Governor Perdue of Georgia was closing state parks because we couldn't afford to keep open the state parks because we couldn't afford to hire people while three miles from the state park we were paying people for 99 weeks to do nothing. 
And so I came up with this following proposal. I just want to toss out for you to think about because I think it's part of the future. What if we modified unemployment compensation to say, we'll give you four weeks to look for a job. If at the end of the four weeks you haven't found a job, we'll continue. I'm not going to fight with liberals over compassion. We'll continue for 95 more weeks. But you will work or go to school three days a week so that you earn what we're going to give you so nobody gets something for doing nothing in America because we can't afford it. Now, let's take the example of public safety. One of the answers historically to public safety is to flood the street. So if I have a community with 6,000 people who are unemployed, and I say, great, 3,000 of you are now, are now street guards, and I want to, I'm going to give you a cell phone and station you, and for three days a week, all 3,000 of you are going to be monitoring your neighborhood. And I just want you to, you're not professional policemen, you're not going to arrest anybody. The minute you see a problem, you dial 911, and a policeman shows up. But the act of having 3,000 people standing on the street where there was nobody suddenly dramatically changes. Or you find people who can read and write and you say, terrific, your job for three days a week is to tutor people who can't read and write. And let me remind you, you cannot afford to think about education reform for K through 12. You have, in a, in a state which has to fundamentally re-educate hundreds of thousands of adults, if you're going to compete in the world market, you have to think of a 24-7 online, on-demand, totally new model of education, much closer to what Apple's doing with the iPhone than traditional bureaucracies. And you've got to say, we're going to figure out ways that if somebody calls us and says, I'd like to move to Michigan, but I need 600 people with the following skill, that we're going to sign a contract that's effective, that by the time they build the factory, the 600 trained people are going to be available. And you don't care what age the people are, so you can't say, well, you know, we'll, we'll fix this problem by, by reforming K through 12, and in 26 years we'll have somebody who can do it. And this is a fundamentally different model. This is an entrepreneurial model of learning that uses technology. For example, get rid of the textbooks and go to either a Kindle or whatever the, the equivalent Barnes & Noble is or whatever the iPad is. You can afford to give kids Kindles for less than the price of the textbooks. And you can then upgrade the Kindle every single year, and your science textbook could actually be edited in real time. It's a fundamentally different model of thinking. The iPhone now, uh, Apple now carries, I think, MIT and Duke uh, undergraduate courses for free. You can just literally pull it up as an app on your iPhone. Now, you can't get credit for it because you're not registered there. All you can do is learn. But learning's not bad. <laughs> Let me give you a similar example, because I, I want to drive home that difference is actually different. I was down at the College of the Ozarks. The College of the Ozarks in, in southern Missouri is one of the six work colleges left in America. This is a very real pattern right after the turn of the, of the 20th century. Uh, these were founded in, this one was founded in 1906. It is the fifth most difficult college in America to get into right after Columbia. You cannot apply unless you need student aid. They don't have any student aid. You have to work 15 hours a week and two 40-hour weeks during the school year. That pays for tuition and books. If you also work through the summer, that pays for room and board. 92% of the students graduate owing no money. 8% graduate owing an average of $5,000 because their senior year they bought a car. Now, they do real work. Every building on the campus has been built by the students. They run the campus. They actually run a, a uh, fruitcake commercial operation, and they run an uh, operation of stained glass products. And they make real money. And they run it as real businesses. Now, they also are... Just think about how cheap this college is. And I've been trying to get somebody to, say, take the poorest neighborhood in Detroit and put a work college and a work Votech school right there and say to people, don't tell me you can't afford it. It's free. But it requires you to work. And I'm prepared to draw a line, because if you're not prepared to work, I'm not prepared to give you anything. And I think that's one of the lines you've got to think about very hard. We have become a country. I'll give you an example. 
The New York Times reports that the Long Island Railroad has 97% of its retirees uh, on disability. Now, if 97% of its retirees on disability, all of you know what the single syllable word for that is. It's called theft. It means you're stealing. It's $250 million from the federal taxpayer in 10 years. You know that it's not 97% disabled. But everybody does it because everybody does it, because why wouldn't you do it? Because you get the extra money, and your friend got the extra money, and it doesn't really hurt anybody, so why don't we all just lie and cheat? You aren't going to keep this country. The reason my book is called To Save America is you're not going to keep this country alive if we become a country of liars and cheats. It's not possible. We used to have a phrase in America, an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. The Soviets had a phrase. The state pretends to pay us, and we pretend to work. <clears throat> there are all too many parts of America that now behave as though they were Soviet, where people either aren't working or they're not working very much, where they think getting away with not working is clever. You aren't going to compete with China this way. I had the embarrassing experience. Clist and I went to China last August. We went to four major cities, uh, Beijing and then three cities in Manchuria. Every city we went to were hosted by senior Chinese officials. They're lecturing me on free enterprise. Why is your country borrowing so much money? Why are you failing to invest in the future? They don't have a stimulus package. They have an investment package. They're building a 225-mile-an-hour rail system connecting every city in China. They think we're nuts. I mean, for me, I grew up as a hardline anti-communist right-winger. To be lectured by Chinese communists on free enterprise was one of the most humbling experiences of my life. <laughs> and what was really bad is they were right. So, so in the tradition of learning widely, I'm going to offer you as one of the rules for Michigan one of the great lessons of Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping is one of the four great liberators of human beings in the last half century, uh, rivaling Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and John Paul II. And he was arrested three times for, for a year or more because he kept arguing with Mao about the impossibility of Mao's model. Deng Xiaoping in 1978 gets the Communist Chinese Party to, to adopt the principle that you have to create jobs, and that to create jobs you have to have a market economy. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a dictatorship. Don't misunderstand me. I, I have no illusions about the Chinese dictatorship. But they come to the realization, and, du, and Deng Xiaoping is very successful in making the argument, if we don't create jobs, they're going to throw us out. So we had better go to work creating jobs. And this argument goes on back and forth. And in 1992, he undertakes what is called the Southern Tour uh, because he goes across the South. And he gives speeches. And if you go to Nanjiang, which is a city in South Central China, you will see a bridge. And on the bridge, you'll see two giant cats, about 12, 14 feet tall. One cat is black and one cat is white. And they commemorate his most famous single phrase. He's in South China, and he's talking to communist apparatchiks, and he says, look, I don't care if the cat is black or the cat is white. I care if it catches the mouse. And what he's saying is, don't tell me communist dogma. Don't tell me ideology. Can you create jobs or not? And if you can't create jobs, your ideology is stupid, because you're, you're not going to be able to survive. Well, it turns out, in order to create jobs, guess what? You need to have a market. You need to encourage capital. You need to have investments. You need to encourage entrepreneurs. You need to have businesses. I mean, the number of people who are eager to redistribute wealth after somebody else creates it, but don't have a clue how it gets there, you can't redistribute the wealth that doesn't exist. You can't organize a union in a, in a factory that isn't built. And if you cut off the wealth creation and you cut off the factory creation, you run out of opportunities. And that's where we are. And this is not just a Michigan problem. This is an American national problem. Because we're at one of the great turning points in our history as a country. Now, it's compounded. But so, so I would just say to you, every time you walk around, you just say to yourself when you run into something that seems pretty stupid, 2 plus 2 equals 4, and does the cat catch the mouse or not? If the cat doesn't catch the mouse, it's not a very good cat. Replace it. If 2 plus 2 equals 17 in this equation, go back and rethink it, because it ain't going to work. Because 2 plus 2 equals 4. And that's just a starting point for every single policy in the state, every single policy in Detroit, to really fundamentally rethink from the ground up. 
Now, there's another reason you have to do this. Government is the fourth bubble. You had information technology in 1999. You had housing in 2007. You had Wall Street in 2008. Government is a bigger bubble than all three of those. And what Greece is warning you about, just as Volvo and Jaguar are warning you about the competition of the next generation, Greece is warning you that politicians for two generations have made promises they will not be able to keep. And, and actually, the most interesting book on this topic is by Sarkozy, the president of France, who, who really walks through the idea that if you care about pensions and you care about health care, you'd better care about the economy, because if you don't figure out how to grow the economy, you're not going to have any money for your pensions or your health care. And so if I were in the Upper Peninsula, I would try to explain to every retiree the whole system's going to collapse if we don't figure out a way to create jobs. So no matter how retired you are, you have a big vested interest in the system because without money, it's going to all fall apart. But if you're dealing with bubbles the size that we now have, you had better have an attitude that says you want every person to help you. I'm, the thing I'm most impressed with in, in dealing with uh, uh, Bob McDonald in Virginia and Chris Christie in, in uh, New Jersey is that both of them were faced with very big budget problems when they came in. And both said, look, I will not raise taxes because raising taxes will kill jobs. A lesson they could have learned, frankly, from this state. Therefore, I have to figure out a way to fundamentally change government to, to get to a balanced budget. And I'm open to any idea that doesn't raise taxes. And the result has been a willingness to have a dialogue that's fundamentally different. Because the truth is, if you start asking, and this again, I'm going to walk you way outside of where you've been. If you start asking, could you do it less expensively? You know you could. I'll give you a simple example. Whether it's the city of Detroit, or, or it's the state government, or it's uh, Oakland County. If the next job vacancy that's open, you were to reverse auction at a time of 14% unemployment, people would apply to do the job for half or a third of the current price and be relatively glad to get a job. But it would shatter all the current structures. If you were to go out and say, you know, we really have a problem getting good science teachers, so we're going to allow people who are experts to teach part-time. Don't have to join the union, don't have to go through credentialing. Uh, Craig Barrett, the former head of Intel, makes the point that as a PhD in physics, he could teach at Stanford, but he couldn't teach at Palo Alto High School. <laughs> Go to rural Michigan. How many cities have an accountant who would come in and teach accounting for one hour a day? How many cities have a pharmacist who'd come in and teach chemistry for one hour a day? Be thrilled to do it. See it as part of citizenship. Fundamentally improve the entire environment of the school. Add a whole new layer of networking for young people. But they're only there for one hour. It would only have the advantages of being inexpensive and involving real knowledge. <laughs> and if you look at the percent of American science teachers who can't, in fact, do science, for that matter, I've, I've always been puzzled by our challenge with, with foreign languages. If we paid every first-generation foreign student in our schools, to teach one American their native language and then taught, paid the American student to teach that student English, you would have learning pools of two people each at almost no cost that would work. It would turn out that the person who was from a foreign country and spoke the language fluently actually spoke it better than the teacher who's currently teaching the language who never spoke it fluently. And it would turn out the two of them could learn from each other. And you'd reestablish a real breakthrough, not about bureaucracy, not about union dues, not about hierarchy, not about structure. It's about learning. And you'd be astonished how much learning would be going on and how much fun the kids would have and how rapidly they would mature because they'd be doing serious work. One last example along this line. I, just, I want to give you a flavor. In the poorest neighborhoods in this state, you should encourage young males to go to work. And you should probably consider seriously charging them no taxes. We should probably actually consider this nationally, to have no FICA tax, no tax of any kind, uh, if you're under a certain age. And the reason is simple. Young males in poor neighborhoods don't like the discipline of being in classes dominated by women. They don't like being in an environment they can't feel secure in. They drop out of school. We spend all this effort wringing our hands. The fact is, what do they want? They want to be active. 
they want to be productive, and they want money. We cut off every legal mechanism for them to do that, so they find illegal ways to make money, and we're shocked. What did you think poor people wanted? And so if we were to say, look, we want to maximize, and by the way, if you go around and ask first-generation millionaires when did they start working, the number who started between 12 and 16 is startling. They learned all the habits of work, savings, and, and, and planning ahead between 12 and 16 years of age. I have a number of friends who are very, very successful. I ask this question regularly. I'm trying to convince my younger daughter to write a book about it because it's fascinating. I mean, you find all these first-generation millionaires who started between 12 and 16. When, of course, we would say to poor children, oh, don't do that. That's going to divert you from the path you ought to be on, which is to get a letter grade, which middle-class people might understand, and nobody in that child's neighborhood understands. So I'm just giving you a flavor and a way of thinking about it. One last very large idea, or two last big ideas. One, I believe you should seriously look at creating in Detroit a citywide enterprise zone and making the argument to your delegation in Congress that the problems of Detroit, which have gone from 1,800,000 to below 900,000 from the highest per capita income in the United States to like 67th, that the problems of Detroit are sufficiently large that we ought to have a 10-year tax holiday. Think of Detroit as, as uh, uh, the, the equivalent of uh, an area that we, we have decided. We did this a little bit in Washington. In 1997, we helped pass an enterprise zone for housing and an enterprise zone for, for businesses. And Eleanor Holmes Norton, who is a, a reasonably liberal Democrat, has given speeches talking about how big the impact was. But let's, let's just say we pretend that Detroit is Puerto Rico for 10 years. Okay? And we just said, you know, no taxes. I mean, again, you have to structure it so people aren't, aren't gaming the system. No taxes for a decade on job creation. No taxes on investment. No taxes on capital gains. As long as they're in Detroit creating jobs in Detroit. And you can walk through a series of things. Zero. Now, I would argue, first of all, the amount we're getting out of Detroit in taxes today is so de minimis that we're not losing much. The minute people begin to believe in Detroit again, the value of property in Detroit is going to go up by a factor of four or five hundred percent. Detroit is probably the most undervalued property in America today because people have lost hope. So your potential upside value increase and the increase in the wealth of the average middle class person in Detroit would be staggering. Now, that would be, and, and, and this is the only point I want to make to you, that is a large enough solution that it begins to meet the size of the problem. We've spent 25 years, 30, if you go back to 1968, we have spent 42 years trying out small solutions to a giant problem. And it doesn't work. And the next wave of small solutions won't work either. My last observation. You should seriously look at either a plan A or a plan B on the right to work. Plan A would be very bold, if this state adopted right to work, nothing would change its investment environment faster. And in fact, in the last poll, 74% of the state believe people ought to have the right to negotiate on their own without being compelled to join the union. So you, you, there's a chance you could actually win the fight. But second, if that's too big a fight to take on, just apply it to public employees. And if that's too big a fight to take on, apply it very narrowly. When the state of Washington adopted an initiative that said public employees could not be forced to give political money, it had to be voluntary. 96% of the teachers in Seattle quit giving money. The drop in, in overall for the entire state was 85%. The morning you're prepared to say, and this goes back to 2 plus 2 equals 4, the morning you're prepared to say, I'm not going to give a handful of political leaders the coercive power to amass resources to force victories they can't win in public. And I think this means you can't do it in the legislature, you've got to do it with initiatives. But sooner or later, you're going to have a wave of initiatives. You're going to fundamentally change the underlying balance of the state because you are still in the last phases of the reaction to the 1930s. And that last phase is not going to be competitive with China. Might be competitive with Illinois, will not be competitive with Indiana. And frankly, if, if, uh, I think that if, if the most likely candidate wins in uh, Wisconsin, it won't be competitive with Wisconsin either. You're going to see Wisconsin go back through the cycle they were in with, Tom, with Tommy Thompson. Uh, so, but you certainly are not going to be competitive with China. So I've given you a sweeping overview. I'm personally very optimistic 
This is the most successful society in the history of the world at attracting people from everywhere on the planet, arousing them to dream of a better future, knitting them together into an integrated future, getting them to work with each other and focus on being creative. I don't see any reason why we can't work through our problems over the next decade and by some time at, at the end of the next decade re-emerge as far and away the most dynamic society on the planet. If we do that, and that requires rethinking litigation, regulation, taxation, education, health, energy, and infrastructure. But if we're prepared to do that, the Chinese won't catch up with us for 100 years. But we have to be, it's not a Chinese problem, it's an American problem. We have to be prepared to put on the table, to be not afraid, to have the courage to do what it takes to launch America, to launch our children and our grandchildren into a better future. And I look forward to your questions and comments.